What's up, everybody? This is Mike Garcia with the BDA Podcast. And we're super excited today. We have Dr. Hilary Cawthon, who's a clinical sports psychologist out of Austin, Texas, with us today. And there she is. Good afternoon, Hilary. How are you? How's the weather in Austin? I'm good. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. You know, it's starting to get cooler, I guess, but still, you know, in the high 80s. I, uh, so it's a nice day. <laughs> I like the burnt orange. You know, you got to rep. So if you're up in Texas, I, up in Austin, you got to rep. So. You have yeah, to. I'm, Horns up, right? I'm loving it. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, 80 degree weather is phenomenal. Like down here, it usually ranges between 95 to, you know, 100. That's where we usually stay. Um, have you ever been down to the RGV? Have you ever visited to the Rio Grande Valley at all? No, I haven't. Uh, it's on the list for sure, but I haven't been down there. How far south have you gotten there from Austin into this area? Uh, so for the south, I've gone is more Louisiana side. So I've gone to Port Arthur, right? So oh, that. Mm-hmm. That, but never south south texas nope <laughs> yeah it's hot man it, it, it's crazy um well you know let's just get started i want to talk to you really quick i want to give you a chance to kind of just introduce yourself let everybody know what you do uh, how long you've been doing it um and you know most importantly there's something i want to i want to talk about when i went to research this so i went to go look for local sports psychologists here in the rgv because i had a parent who actually had asked me about one and I said, mm-hmm. man, you know, I don't know anybody. I said, let's take a look. So I started looking and Googling and trying to find people locally, and there was no one here. Um, so on top of maybe just introducing yourself, give us a little bit of background with you. You know, Also, for any kids that may be listening, be interested in this field, especially here in the RGV, I think they'd have it cornered because there's nobody here. Yeah. You know, what, what can they do? What does that look like? The education, the process also would be really cool just for any of the kids that may be listening. Um, who are sure, interested. of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like we said, I'm a clinical sports psychologist, and I think just to add more breadth to what that looks like, right, I function on what like I call continuum of care model for a lot of my athletes. And so I'm a licensed psychologist, um, and then I'm also a certified mental performance consultant, which is a certification you get um, that really teaches the optimization of performance, right? Okay. So, you know, individuals, whether they're athletes, performing artists, you know, those that want to enhance their game at some level from the mental capacity, we have that training. Awesome. But, you know, the niche niche area of focus in is really mental health and athletes. You know, I really believe in treating the, you know, person within the player, if that makes sense, and helping them represent you know, they're one component of who they are, and then there's a sport component, and there's, like, all factors. And so if they can build a nice, healthy self, then they're going to be able to optimize in school and performance, and then as they transition into life. And so um, I really felt it was important twofold when I'm working with athletes in general is understanding, like, how do I treat those um, that might suffer from mental health symptomology into mental illness um, and building up that, that life skills dynamic and then the other side is just I love sports so much. And mm-hmm. so it's this continuum that I know how sport can transcend someone's life and how exercise is a foundation for mental health. And so our non-athletes, right, utilizing exercise in the body and the components behind that integrating together to build mentally well people is really what I function from. Awesome. Um, you know, and so I think my range of what I work with for clients are our youth athletes. They specialize a lot with youth athletes, youth sport for a long time coaching education, parent education, um, and that shifted and progressed as I've progressed in the field. I've been doing this for ooh, going about 16 years, and so I've progressed into um, collegiate athletes and pro sports at different dynamics, um, whether it's talent acquisition, building up cultural environments. I'm a strong proponent for understanding this holistic approach and having the foundation of the culture being really sound and healthy and then having individuals thrive within that on top of the individual work that I do, um, which shows you that you can do a breadth of anything in this wow. field, right? Mm. <laughs> Your niche area. Um, so the students that are interested, I think um, where I've strived and what's helped me is, you know, I got a, I was a dual major um, and, you know, so my pathway is a little bit long because we didn't have the pathways that set up now, but I was a kinesiology major. I really went in understanding the foundations of the body and the aspects of coaching dynamics. And, you know, you learn a lot being a kinesiology major of principles of coaching, um, you know, anatomy, physiology, right. understanding if I ever have injured athletes, right? That was a core foundation of just understanding those concepts. Um, and then I was also a psychology major, you know, I was fortunate enough to know at an early age what I wanted to do, partly from my own youth sport experience and wanting to have um, someone who understood the competitive mind, but also could help build up the life skills foundation, someone to talk to and having the sports psychology, knowing the pathway. 
um, led me into my degrees of sports psychology, which taught me the foundation of traditional optimization skills of goal setting and visualization and, you know, mindset shifts. Um, and then I got my clinical degree in clinical psychology to be a licensed psychologist. And, nice. you know, there's different pathways. Um, not, not everyone in our field becomes a licensed psychologist. They will be a certified mental performance consultant where they get the traditional foundations of kinesiology and the traditional sports psychology, pedagogy, mental skills training. Right. And they work a lot with optimization and teaching skills and the mental aspect, like physical skills, but just how your mind works so you can set yourself up for success. Um, but you're right. There's not many of us. Yeah. Um, it's, we're, the field is probably still, in its, you know, it's late adolescence now. If we look at like developmental lifespan, you know, right. it, it started progressing in the 80s and 90s. And, and now I think what's helped for individuals trained like me, there's been a shift in the last five or six years with professional athletes and collegiate athletes speaking openly about mental health, mental illness, this week alone sparks mental illness awareness week. And so it's this advocate for, you know, normalizing that athletes are human and athletes experience um, everyday emotions and functions and struggles. And um, it, it gives an avenue for my work to be more impactful. Yeah. You know, it's true. I think mental illness is, or even mental health is something that was, wasn't really looked at. Uh, before now, like you said, there's a lot more athletes coming out, you know, talking about it, whether it be some forms of depression sometimes or even anxiety or even dealing with life. Right. And like how what life comes to them, what comes with sport, because everyone will think of an athlete and just think, oh, here's this, you know, here's LeBron with all these great things. But, you know, everyone's going to have something that kind of they're dealing with all the time. And it's how do they not allow that to affect their performance, right? And not affect their right. team, right? On top of that, because you're a part of a team now and coaches. Um, with that, I kind of want to talk about it. Yeah, I, you know, you talked about uh, um, talent acquisition, right? So mm -hmm. what does that look like? So let's say, you know, I know we have some, some kids here that are going through um, recruitment process right now. Schools are reaching out to them. They're doing their visits, you know, they're training. Um, what's, what, what, what would be that part of the, in the mental right health game and then that part there what what would what's that look like yeah i think for our you know our high school athletes that are in this recruiting phase they have all the power and they don't realize it right it feels like when you're this high school student athlete that you know are they going to pick me am i going to be good enough but i always try to encourage my athletes like you're the one who's interviewing the school you're right. the one who is saying is this the fit for me can i thrive there is it an environment that is going to teach me and help me level up my game is an environment that I will be comfortable in and feel safe in and feel secure and like be wanting to be there every day, especially if you're leaving home and you're going further away. Like, can you see yourself in a comfortable environment? Um, and relationships matter. I mean, at the core root of all of these things, you have to have a trusted relationship that you feel is a place that you can grow and feel safe in when things do get hard or when you want to celebrate your success with. Right. So I think from that standpoint, you know, having student athletes really setting up the framework of like what's important to them, what is an environment they want to live in, what dynamics from a coach perspective they want, what teammates they want to have, what diversity they want, they want to explore in, you know, if they lost sport today, and this is like this terrifying question to ask, but really if they lost sport, would they be happy there? Would they be able to be successful in what the studies were going to be and, and be in an environment that they could sell academically and socially? Right. Um, because you have to think about those things. Sometimes injuries happen, unfortunately, and it's difficult, or even your playing time. Like, I'm a, a collegiate athlete myself. Like, you go in thinking the top of the world, you're recruited, you're number one. And you get there and it's like this eye opener of like everybody that came here is number one also right, or number right. top mm -hmm. five. And mm -hmm. so you're now no longer the best. And it's a really humbling experience of, oh, what does it take now to work hard to be better again than I was and still feel that you're valued and respected? You know, when we look at the flip side, when I'm talking with organizations, whether that's, you know, a college team or a professional team, it's really having them understand like what is their environment that they have in place? What type of individuals are they seeking? The character basic, the core root of the individual that can be a human, right? I think we lose sight of the human nature and it's like this person is a human and can they have the skill set that you want them to have in your locker room? And do they have the skill set that they can represent your brand? Because now with NIL and with the branding mechanisms of social media and marketing, you have to have someone who can represent what you want in your culture and can be that voice for 
who the team is outside of the playing field and be what the culture is from a university or professional sports and that you will represent that part of you when you're bringing someone in. And then do they have the ability to turn things on, on field, the talent, you know, things of that nature. And, you know, when we look at why people get picked or it's not like there's tons of talented athletes, the X factor is the human nature. And so I'm always telling my athletes, like, be you, be your best version, show who you are, show what you can bring because, you can enhance talent to work ethic and you can enhance these skill sets, but like we want you to be a great human on top of that. Right. I think that's a big one too because you have a lot of high school athletes who maybe don't get involved in the media. They're great, right, in high school. And then all of a sudden in college, you're on a different level. You know, you have Saturday night games or certain games, you know, baseball, volleyball, swim, whatever it is. And now the media is in their face, right? And they're out here and they have to talk. And a lot of people look at the school, they don't know the coaches. They don't know who, but they know that athlete or that homegrown athlete is now representing that college. So it, it, it seems like it would be a lot of pressure for the kids to make sure that they're representing right. So I like the fact that we're able to speak to that, that the character of the athlete, right, is it plays a big factor uh, when they're representing those schools, right, especially on a higher level. Yeah, and I think this is the part that we don't maybe coach to enough and where it's really important to figure out what kind of coach do you need to help level your game. It might not be the physical skills, right? Maybe it's the rehab process, the strength and conditioning. Maybe it is media training or emotional, you know, mental skills training that allows you to build you and yourself as the athlete to be better because there are skills that you have to learn. Right. The, um, so I like, you know, you talk about... And this is something, you know, we talk to the kids who are coming in out of the gym all the time. It's like, hey, you know, you're going to this next level. You know, everyone's a number one, right? So now you're talking about this individual who, you know, does so well. And it's, it's almost shocking. They jump into that environment and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, everybody here. You know, the talent gap has now closed. It's much thinner. Everyone's the same. So how does that, you know, how that's, you know, we're talking about the individual, right? Just a person there. And now they're in that team environment. So how does mm-hmm. someone go about, you know, keeping a really positive attitude there and that humbling experience. And, you know, you don't want to affect the team, right? We're talking about the team now, right? Now you're part of this team. How is it that, you know, how, how do athletes, how are they able to make that transition thinking that individually now I've worked really hard here I am. And now boom, everyone is there. That talent gap is now thin, right? And you're part of a team. You don't want animosity amongst your teammates, right? You have to make this machine work, right? Everyone's working for the same goal. Uh, what in your experience? What have you uh, seen there when, when students get there? Yeah, I think successful athletes or athletes who maybe transition more successfully are um, those who come in and have real understanding of what their role clarity is, what their expectations are, what the standard of the culture is, where they're already fitting, um, but not getting stuck there either, right? I think athletes need to come in and say, okay, if, if they want to be a starter, an impact player, you know, you have to be realistic. Is that going to happen right now? And if it's not going to happen right now, what's the timeline? How do you get there? Don't stop yourself from reaching towards those goals, but be realistic with this is my long-term goal. When do I get to have that happen? And what am I doing every day that allows me to reach there? And then just shifting your role. Like athletes perform their best when they have a purpose. And if the purpose isn't competing, but the purpose is showing up and being the best teammate or being a practice player now because you're not getting in the game you still can get better because you never know when you're going to get called on. And so the athletes that are ready and prepared are those that actually show up saying, Hey, I plan to play one day. I plan to compete. I plan to make an impact. And that might happen this weekend and it might happen next year, but every day I'll be ready because I'm here mentally engaged. I'm physically doing the work. And now I get to be a teammate and be a part of this culture. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of work and emotions are real and it, sucks when you're a competitor and you're not playing like right. we can't deny any of that it's really hard right um and that's where we just have to make sure that the relationships are intact and you have a good culture that can make sure i'm making everyone better that's beside me yeah that that brings me to i've had uh, a few coaches on and i've always talked to them about building a culture and the team culture and the environment right when it comes to coaching and coaches and you know how you know coach, coaches come and they build really great winning environments, right? And they come in and you know it's about this win and you know they're building. I had one coach tell me, "Hey, you know, I'm building good men. You know, I'm not looking mm-hmm. for athletes, but I'm trying to build good good men. So when they leave here and they go into their life, you know, they took something out of this sport. In this case, it was basketball. They took something out of basketball and they're able to take that and run it through their life and just be good men. 
Um, a, co- a couple coaches too talk about you know being on time, and everyone stands for something when they're building the culture. You know, I've never heard any coaches really talk about the mental the mental health part of culture building, yeah. right? And so, you know, what does that look like? You know, I, I can say for sure in my experience, I don't think I've ever experienced that, or maybe I did. It was just unsubtle, and I had no idea. But you know, what does that look like normally? Yeah, I think uh, hopefully we're seeing a shift, right? When we look at these high performance environments, those that have high performance summits, it's it's more of an interdisciplinary approach now, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's not just siloing like strength conditioning and athletic training and, you know, coaching dynamics. It's like mental performance is a part of the strength conditioning and the training. It's like high performance functioning on top of the coaching dynamic and, the, and that framework. And we're all speaking in the same language, the same intent. Um, and I think those cultures that get it right have a standard of excellence. They do understand and they're very transparent that winning is that's the outcome of sport. That's the outcome and the nature of what we do. Mm-hmm. And we can't dismiss that, right? We want to be a winning <laughs> team. Like no one wakes up wanting to lose. Right. Um, but I think if you name it, but you don't make that the only focus, it's what allows us to be a winning team. And what does winning really mean? Are we winning in life? Are we winning in and out of the field? Are we winning both? And then having these core, you know, performance indicators that allow you to reach those standards of excellence. And, it starts with the people in the environment setting that framework. So if I believe my teammates should show up on time or my athletes should show up on time, I will be there on time, prepared, right. dressed the way that I want to dress and looking the part and taking care of myself. Um, you know, men- being mentally well also means that we represent and we take care of our own self care needs. And so hopefully you're seeing environments where they're modeling you know, mindfulness and relaxation and recovery as a part of the environment. And um, it's still in a process where you take care of people from preparation to compete zone to then recovery framework of what they're working in. Yeah, I feel like the recovery aspect is a big one, too, because, you know, and Mm -hmm. this kind of leads into injury, which is something I wanted to talk about, too, because injury... It's inevitable. It's going to happen in sports. It's, you know, from the minorest things to maybe like a turf toe or just a strain. And it can even go more into even some career ending injuries, right? It really kind of happens. Um, you know, pre- preparing athletes for injury, it's, it's, it's almost difficult because it, you have to almost experience it to go through it, right? And a lot of the times when I've talked to athletes and parents, their concern is like, oh, you know, how long will it take? When will they be back? When can I go full full out, right? And when it, I'm always talking to them like, hey, you know, the timetable we have is not the time, the calendar with the games or the, the competition dates, but it's going to be just for the tissue to heal whatever they need to do, right? For the time it takes for any orthopedic injury. Uh, but then there's the mental part of the game after that, that they've been out of the game, right? And I've talked to a couple athletes and hey, I said, what are you worried about? And they're like, well, I'm just worried I'm going to lose some skill or I'm going to, you know, lose this this uh, part of my game. Um, how will we coach that up? How, how does that look? How can we help athletes who are injured, you know, understand a little more about that process? Yeah. Yeah. And I think what I'm fortunate enough when I work with my team environment, like having a really solid foundation and working relationship with the strength coaches, the athletic trainers, the physical therapists, the team doctors, right? Anytime we have an injured athlete, right? It's the return to play process. And at what point do I get to be involved with that athlete? kind of rehabilitation programming. Um, And I think to your point, it depends on the severity of the injury, right? So if it's the first time injury for an athlete, right off the bat, you want to have someone check. Like I want to go check in with that athlete because they've never experienced this. It's overwhelming. There's lots of emotion, Mm -hmm. so much fear is having in place. When it's a long-term injury, like for example, let's say it's uh, ACL tear, which is really terrible and scary and, Mm -hmm. you know, problematic. That's a long rehab process. They're not going to necessarily want to talk to me every single week, all the time. We might implement different cycles of the mental game for them in their recovery phase where you're doing visualization, you're doing goal checks, you know, you're doing coping skills. And then we switch that to the return to play as they're progressing in cardio movements and more, you know, agile training. We have to process what it looks like to feel and move with their body and connect. And so then the return to play gets more enhanced with that mental training alongside of it versus maybe an acute ankle sprain and you're out for 15 days, it might be an immediate, hey, how are you? What's the plan? How are we coping? And we get right back in. And so absolutely do I always feel that there should be a sports like mental skills coach involved in return to play? Yeah. And it's coordinating and working with those in the rehab process of what's the best approach of when you enter into their return to play training plan. Um, Because every athlete is different based on first time injury, third injury, what type of injury, um, 
But the mental capacity to get back to play is the ability to actually help rehab because you know how to relax your body and allow your body to heal is a very natural process and visualization that you can do to help, you know, enhance the recovery process during it, during the healing phase is really key. So there's lots of components that this person can work side by side with the physical trainings of rehab. That's awesome. Um, I love I love the interdis- interdisciplinary idea. You know, I think that's really where it does start. When you have one team and everyone kind of focus on the same idea, I think that really does help the athlete. When they're not hearing a mixed message from the coach or the PT or the strength conditioning coach, everyone's on the same page and everyone's shooting for the same goal. I love it. Uh, it's yeah. awesome. The, that leads me to another question, too. So parents in injury, right? So when it comes to parents also, I think there's a – parents get, absolutely get – I mean, it's emotional. I had a son who, I mean, as I'm, I'm a PTA and as a therapist, he went down with an ACL tear and I was like running off the field. I was, you know, running, I was almost like, no one get near him. You know, I'm going to get in here. And it was like this like craziness. And, you know, I'm doing these special tests and is he okay? And, you know, I'm taking him to the ER and I can remember definitely the stresses, you know, as a parent sitting in the bleachers and seeing that happen. But then the recovery process you know, it was a little different because I'm a therapist, so I did his therapy. I rehabbed my son. So, you know, I was able, right. I know exactly what that looks like, right? I know exactly what he has to go through. But the itch for him to get back, the itch for my son to get back to the field was strong, which drove his rehab. And it was having the conversation with him, which was a tough one, to tell him, hey, man, you know, this is going to take a little longer than you would think. And there's no way I can let you go back out there if I don't think you're ready, you know, not just as your therapist, but as your father, right? There's a part there. Um, how can parents help in that? Cause I know, you know, it's almost, it's very desperate when you see your little one go down, you know, and you see someone you love go down, you know, it's, you know, there's some acts of desperation sometimes. Um, how can I mean, parents cope? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm a mom of four kids, so I know <laughs> like the, I think the parenting rule that we don't get, but it's like, you never want you to see your kid in yeah. pain. You never want to, you want to take all of it away. You don't want anything bad to ever happen. It's a grandiose idea and that's not real life. But I think with, with parents and injuries, like education is the first thing that has to happen. Right. And parents, you know, have to learn how to regulate their own emotions in response to this. The kids are going to feed off of the parents' energy and the emotional energy that's there. And the more that the parent and the child can communicate um, is really essential. Like if you're scared as a parent, like own the feelings, model that, say, Hey, this is really scary. I'm not sure if I have all the answers. We're going to find this out together really taking a team approach with your athlete. Um, I think the hard part where parents don't know is like they get confusing messages. They read different things. They try to like, you know, they do the habit of like, let me Google all this stuff Mm -hmm. or look at what little Johnny did here, but Susie had this happen. And it's like, find the trusted people in your circle, talk and ask the right questions, make a good plan, be a part of the plan. Um, but having role clarity for the parent as well. Like, what is it that the parent needs to do in terms of that rehab process? How do they support the child? Um, how do they have the, how do they answer the questions for their kid or how do they get resources so the child can be, you know, clear on that? I had a recent example with, um, a good parenting friend. Her kid was going through a really significant injury rehab process and, you know, she was getting confusing things. She was cleared by one doctor, but then the physical therapist was like kind of questioning her clearance. And I said, you know, I think you need to educate your child on what these what these tests mean when they're going to physical therapy and like what are they actually understanding if they don't pass these tests and put their energy in behind this, they won't get cleared to play. Right. Is this an issue or not? Like so it's educating the child too on what do these things mean in the process and how you get to kind of get cleared at different levels. And sometimes the parents do have to advocate for their kids and make sure the kids are understanding what they're going through as well. And so it, it has to be a team approach. Um, you know, and we have a lot of sport parents and sometimes the parents maybe need to just say, Hey, take a minute. I got it. You're making your kid nervous. Mm-hmm. You know, let me find a different way to communicate to you. And mm-hmm. uh, it's hard because parents just want to make sure their kids find and safe and happy and, you know, it's going to be okay. And if we can reassure parents that we will make sure that they'll get back to being healthy, like, that would be the bottom goal. Yeah, you know, I, it it becomes difficult, even like through the the smallest injuries, because you know, children have a lot of questions, and I think parents go straight to Google, you know, and they try mm-hmm. to look it up, and they look at timetables, and they're telling their kid, oh yeah, this is the time you'll be back, and this is it. But again, I I guess the message I'm hearing from you, it's really about communication. It's about bringing everybody in, bringing in the athlete, bringing in the parent, make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, yeah, you know, coaches it seems an injury sometimes. Coaches seem 
to try to hurry this back, right? As soon as they can, like what's this time frame look like? I've had some conversations with coaches before, um, you know, and tough ones, maybe they didn't quite hear, you know, didn't want the, to hear what I had to say about, you know, the return for that, for, for that athlete. But ultimately, ultimately, you know, talking with the athlete and the family was rest assuring, you know, knowing, Hey, you know what, like we want to make sure the best, this is the best for the athlete um, before they get back. Yeah, and I think, with, with coaches, and I think this is the hard part, depending on is it a, a school sanctioned sport, right? Is this a, you know, club sport, select level, like who's handling the internal processes, right? If it's not within the club and it's external medical care, right? The conversations, the dialogue, it is probably led by the parent, you know, about their athlete. And the one thing I encourage, you know, parents, like when we look at injuries, like they become an invisible athlete. Right, they're on the sidelines and they're invisible because they're probably not rehabbing on the side. The team doesn't realize the work that these kids are putting in mentally, emotionally, and physically to rehab to get back on the field. Um, they're disconnected. They've lost a part of their identity, especially depending on where they're at. So I always encourage parents: Yeah, maybe the kid needs a break, and you don't want to take them to every practice. Can you take them to one practice out of the week to be presently there? Can you have them show up at games, let them have a role where they feel connected to their team? Because at some point they want to come back into that team. Um, And and that's the hardest part is we don't want the athlete to feel invisible and uh, isolated and alone. And the coach will also have present of mind when the athlete is there. And so I always encourage that piece too. Hey, I know you like to have your like three days a week back and the kid has time to do homework and it's nice, but at least once we get them back in involved with their team so they stay connected. I love that. That's a great that's a great tip. Thank you. That's a really good one. That's something definitely I can see that model working with a lot of the kids yeah. that we see. Hey, you know, I was recently reading, you know, it was like a an, an old book I had through college and it was like maybe the principles of, you know, some idea, but um, I want to talk about in, intrinsic and extrinsic goals or achievements, right? So we have a, a thing we do in the BDA, we have an athlete of the month, right? And we highlight an athlete who's worked really hard, maybe com- coming back from injury, maybe someone who is doing really well. And we have this championship belt, you know, we hand it to the to the child and he puts it on and, you know, we take pictures and they hold on to it for a month and, you know, they can take it with them or do whatever they want with it. And we kind of give it to every, every um, we kind of give it to every athlete who is deserving, we feel. So, the, the problems I run into sometimes is that I have some kids who are, they're driven eccentrically. Their goal, mm-hmm. the belt doesn't matter. They're not there for, you know, a trophy and, you know, they work super hard. These, some of these kids are signed to college and not there, but they, they that reward system really doesn't work for them. Now for someone who, you know, is more of like intrinsic and they like the trophies and all that stuff and that really drives them and motivates them. How do I go about, and I'm asking like me personally, how do I go about motivating those athletes, right? When yeah. I'm trying to get them who are, they're really, you know, it's, 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 it's not out there. They don't need that trophy or that belt or that thing. They're just driven. They're the most disciplined child. They're working hard. They got their, their sign. They're going to school. They got their scholarships and they're rolling. And I'm trying, how do I reward this child, right? <laughs> who's so the, who's yeah. goal oriented is just really inside. Hey, how, do, how do you do that? Yeah, I think first it's knowing what their why is, right? Like, what is their why? What's their driving source? Like, motivation is like the gas to our car, right? And it helps us kind of get to places. It's the energy force. And so if they're intrinsically motivated, it's because they like to know, right? They enjoy this, the sport itself. They enjoy the training. They enjoy the environment of what's around them, right? Um, and so it's almost saying if, if you have an athlete, it's like, oh man, I just really love to see how my body can push itself. And I find enjoyment with like seeing myself do those accomplishments. You make your validation and praise an external factor targeted to that. Hey, Johnny did an amazing job pushing himself every day when he came in and he's the athlete of the month, right. because now you've labeled what that outcome is. It's not just athlete of the month. It's a personalized factor because they, were positive every day or they push themselves to new strengths and they increase their, you know, workload at X level, you know, or they did get a college scholarship and that mm-hmm. was the outcome we want to highlight. And so mm-hmm. it's knowing the athlete, I would ask them like, Hey, what are your goals? What pushes you? How can I push you to be better? What do you need for support for me? And then making the targeted feedback to that point, mm-hmm. you know, everyone likes feedback. Everyone likes validation. Everyone likes to be rewarded that way, but it's more personal when it connects to their why. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great. Um, you know, the other thing too I want to talk about 
is, you know, I, I get athletes who train in different places who come, you know, from one place to another. Maybe uh, they didn't like their coach there for some reason. You know, for me, it's always the environment I like to build. It's a, it's, it's a competitive environment. I really like to build for my athletes, but I really encourage them kind of competing with themselves. And I can put this in an example, like, we'll, let's say we have like a 510-5 five, five, five drill or some drill that we'll be running. And you get in a room and you're going to have a middle school child, you know, a freshman, a senior, and a college athlete, let's say. You know, I mean, that's, that's a huge, that's just for example. Yeah. And we start these timers, right? And the first thing I always tell them is like, hey, you know what? I don't even want you, you're, we're going to take the first time and I want you to beat this time. Like, you don't worry about the guy who's running and his time and worry about this person's time. All I want you to do is to run and try to, you know, beat your own time here. And it's always, you know, I've gotten really good feedback from parents, you know, about the attitude with the kids that there's no yelling and there's no screaming mm -hmm. or putting them down. It's always really encouraging, right? Um, in your experience, how damaging can it be when there's a coach, right, out there and, you know, trying to train this, these children and maybe the, the, they don't have the best, right, the best approach, right? As a parent, how can they talk to this coach? Because a lot of the times, you know, some parents are intimidated, worried that, okay, if I talk to the coach, the way he's talking to my kid, that maybe they'll cut that game time. Or maybe he doesn't want to train my child anymore. Or he can go do his strength somewhere else. Or that's what he needs. It's something really hard, you know. Um, how, how can a parent deal with that? Yeah, I mean, the, the coach-athlete relationship is it's really tricky. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's very similar to a coach parent relation or a parent child relationship in a sense, especially when they're young, you know, kids that are elementary, middle school, even high school age. Right. Um, these athletes are competing to seek approval to have, you know, sometimes the coach is a parental figure. Um, sometimes they view them that way, very fatherly or motherly in sense, and they want to please and perform for the feedback and validation and respect from their coach. And so I think sometimes coaches don't realize the power they have and the weight they carry as this figure in this athlete's life, um, which leads to like the problematic, toxic, like yelling, verbal abuse, if we call mm -hmm. it for what it is, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, we would never, your boss can never speak to you this way. Your teacher can never speak to a student that way in the classroom environment, but Sport has this bracket of morality that we allow coaches to say things to our kids that we would never let other people say, right? right? We wouldn't let that happen. Um, and I think it starts with one, parents asking themselves, is this the environment that my kid can thrive in? Is this a healthy environment that my kid can actually learn from, improve from, and reach the goals that they want to have? You know, Or is it detrimental, right? You have to check in. And a lot of parents, I don't think, watch coaches enough and check into the environment enough to say, hey, is this the relationship I want my child to have with somebody? Is this who I want them to learn from? Um, and more so, like, we can't control someone else's behavior. We can't do that. And there's fear that they'll cut them, they won't play right. them, that they, you know, so how can you talk to your child saying, hey, this is how I want you to respond. Here's good coping skills. Here's good goals for you. Here's what we believe in and have a supporting and safe environment for the kids to thrive in even if there's an external voice that's negative or impactful. Um, now, the kid will tell you, I love my coach. Even if two days ago the coach yelled at them and said, you're crap, right? right, and how terrible, and there'll never be anything. Mm -hmm. Three days later, the coach is going to praise him and think that he's amazing, and now the kid's happy again, right? So it's a weird balance. Right. And so I think we have to make sure at home – the kid gets to be the kid. They can enjoy what they're doing. We let the kid lead the discussion in sport and we don't put our own views on, Hey, are you sure that's okay? Are you sure this is okay? Like, you know, or we don't compare other kids to our kid either. Like, Oh, Sarah had an amazing game today. Do you see how she did X, Y, or Z? Cause your kid might realize, well, I'm not good enough then right. if Sarah's just that, then we're talking about them. And so it's a really tricky dynamic. Parents really, you just got to love watching your kid play. You got to make sure the kid's in a safe environment. Um, listen to them first, hear what they're saying, hear how they're talking about their sport experience, uh, and then finding the time of when you can kind of check in with them of how are you doing? Are you learning? Are you happy? Are you thriving? You know? Yeah, yeah I love I love the list you sent me too. You know, the list yeah. you sent me. I'll be posting that out again um, when we release the podcast. And I think those are great types of parents, right? And, um, yeah. you know, you have those that live through their kids sometimes and they kind of forget about their athlete. Right. And they're pushing them so hard and maybe sometimes they don't want to compete or they'll lose the edge, you know, sometimes that those children will have. Right. And, 
So, yeah, and I think when we look at that sport parenting list, like not to get caught up in good or bad. Ideally, we want everyone to be a supportive parent, and most people think they are, but we all fall in different times and phases of vicariously living through our kid to investing in our kid's success to independently not being around because he's got to do work. And like we all fall into these patterns. But if you can come back to the root of, I want to be supportive, I want my kid to be happy, I want to be happy watching them play, and like let go of the outcome based dynamic it becomes a lot more enjoyable for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I believe that. Yeah, that's great. Um, so we have some questions. So this weekend we went okay. through, yeah, we went this weekend, this weekend we put out a post and we asked parents, we asked coaches and we asked our athletes if they had any questions. If you had a sports psychologist and you wanted to ask a question, you know, what would you ask? So I'm going to go through the list if I can read my own handwriting. It, it, it was really, <laughs> I have this trigger finger thing happening and I have this really poor handwriting. But uh, the first one came from a coach and some asked to be anonymous. So I'll keep those anonymous, right? And others were, you know, were okay with the handles. Those things there. So this came from a, a volunteer coach. Okay. So he says, I'm a volunteer coach. Uh, I don't get paid to coach. Uh, and parents are very quick to at- attack and question my decisions. Um, what can I tell these parents in, you know, to make that stop. And that is anonymous. Uh, one of our parent volunteer coaches. Yeah. I think, you know, setting the framework from the very beginning of the season of here's your expectations, here's your coaching philosophy. Um, you know, before we get our own emotions in the way, when people are going to see back, like kind of sitting and saying, what are they trying to say to me? What is the parent trying to say? What are they trying to do? Um, but, you know, I think finding ways, that good coaches communicate back in and stick consistently to their message of like, you know, here's the three things that we're working on this week, whether it's being a good teammate, having fun, ball control, right? And like just reinforcing that. Um, but coaches have to have set boundaries, right? And we have to know what behaviors we tolerate and what we don't. And it might have to warrant conversations of like to this parent, hey, I'm just here trying to make your kids be great and have a good time. And if you want to help coach, like, sign up next year. I know that's right. terrible to say sometimes, <laughs> but we haven't set the boundary. Like, right. And I think parents forget and they get in their own way. Like, I mean, I'm sure I've been at it too when mm-hmm. I've watched my own kids. Like, sometimes like the volunteer parent, like, yeah, they're not trained to be this great right. technical coach, right. but they want to be spending time with their kid. They want to be investing and being a part of the child's life. Absolutely. And like, let's praise that. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, thank you for volunteering your time. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Yeah, and that's true. Uh, you know, kids, uh, a lot of those... Co- Parents aren't trained. Some don't, don't play that sport, and they want to step up and just spend that time with their child, right? It's great. I love it. Um, let's see. So the other one here is coming from, again, from it's going to be an anonymous athlete. And she says, um, I don't want to play college sports, but my parents have made me go to numerous showcases. Um, I don't have an interest in for it at any other level. How do I let them know without letting them down? So I think that's that's a big one, yeah. Yeah, this is tough. And I think that this is the tricky part of um, how do you voice your own needs without saying you want to quit? Like you might just want to be a successful high school athlete and then transition to a different phase of your development. Um, I would tell that athlete first, you're not deciding anything today. There's no decision that you're making today. You're not deciding on what college you're going to, what you're doing in the future. By going to showcase, can you enjoy just playing? You know, like take the pressure off yourself of what that showcase means and just say, you know what, parents sign me up for this. Like, I just get to go play the game. I love playing the game and I get to play the game um, and keeping an open mind, right? Because they might fall in love with it differently and decide maybe they do want to, you know, play college sports. Mm. I think if the pressure from the parents becomes to be involved around which college they want to go to, what do they want to do, then it becomes the dynamic of, hey, I really love playing right now and that's where I'm at today. I don't know if I want to decide to play in the future or not. It just isn't bringing the same joy, but I'm really loving playing right now. Yeah, I love it. That's great. Awesome. Um, we have a next one here from, this is from Jen underscore 2014. And she, she, asks, she says, I get nervous before games, worried about my performance. Um, what are some ways I could calm myself down? So that's like pregame jitters. You know, that sounds like there, right? I, th- I think... A lot of people experience that. You know, what are some skills or some coping skills you, that athletes could do uh, to help themselves yeah. in that situation? Well, Jen underscore twenty fourteen, I love this one. Um, one is about how we label that feeling, right? So when we think about feeling really excited, our heart is increased. We start sweating. We start getting the jitters. When we get nervous, our body responds the same way. But if you tell yourself like, "Oh, this is just activation. This is my body telling me I'm ready to perform." Now you expect to be nervous and it doesn't have to be negative. It doesn't control you. 
I think when it becomes to feel like, oh, this is too overwhelming, breath control is the best thing. Intentional breathing allows your body to calm down and then you can think more clearly and just respond differently. So just taking a big deep breath in, holding the tension a little bit and then exhaling out, do that two to three times and then you can get back into the present moment. Man, I love it. That's awesome. Um, I have another one here. Um, this is an anonymous mom. And she says, Mom, you know, my daughter's coming back off an injury, and it seems like she has a mental block in her game. How can I help her with that? So that, I think it kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the injuries, right? The kind of yeah, earlier, but, uh, right? Yeah. Maybe getting involved. I'm, yeah, as a mom, <laughs> um, or as a parent, or as a coach, anyone, like, um, let's not assume what we don't know, yeah. right? So if we have this thought, or if we see these things happening, just ask your kids. You know, ask them how they're feeling. Ask them if they do you have any fears. Make it normal to talk about feelings. Make it normal to talk about things you're afraid of. Um, and if they're like, no, no, I'm fine. You could say, hey, I'm worried for you. It was really scary watching you get hurt. And I'm actually worried. So um, it's great that you're letting me know you're okay. And, you know, that's, that's going to be very helpful. And I think if the kid does come back saying, yeah, I'm actually really scared and uh, I'm afraid I'm going to get hurt again, talk through it. You know, the only way we can reduce fear is actually naming it and talking through it. Wow. Yes. I love, uh, you know, I, the, really what I'm getting here, it seems like communication is just, you know, that's the key, right? Being able to talk yeah. about these things with, with your mom, with your dad, with your performance coach, with your strength coach. It's really about communication. I love it. Um, this one comes from RZAM112. And he says, after, I f- after COVID, I found it hard to get back into team and social environments. Uh, why mm-hmm. do I feel this way? I was normally the most outgoing on the team, very comfortable and now I almost, my, he just says he starts to feel nerves during Goodness. those this days. Are then one, two, one, one, two, yeah. <laughs> this, like, this is so common for so many people. I'm so glad that they spoke openly and named that feeling mm-hmm. because I think a lot of people are afraid to admit, like, going back into this environment again is hard. And, like, we got comfortable being at home and engaging with our small group. And it takes a lot of energy to connect to people and to be on and to, like, constantly be responding and reacting and so yeah you're like overstimulated for for better or worse right like going back in this environment is right. lots of stimulation and it's tiring and so you have to go back to practice it and get routines to get used to it um but if you're not comfortable i think right now like find small habits one person another person that you connect with that you can kind of build into until you can kind of put the energy on to be more outgoing and engaged but you grow and adapt differently. So maybe you were outgoing before and now you're more isolated and selective and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, like be who you are right now. I love it. Awesome. Um, and then the last one here, we have a few more. I'm just going to wrap up the, that QA. Let me see. We're going to go with, um, here's a good one. So this one comes from Jolie.zf and she asks, after a game or a loss, I feel like it's all my fault. As a pitcher of the game, the as a pitcher in the game, the weight is on my shoulders. How can I deal with those losses? That's a tough one there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I could say the generic thing that everyone has an impact and one mm-hmm. play doesn't define all things. But right. the reality is, like, there's pressure and it's right. real. And your performance, you're going to analyze far more than other people. And what I say is have a reflective process routine. So after each practice and after each game, if you can go in and just simply write, what did I do well today? What do I need to work on? And what's my plan tomorrow? It takes away the immediate emotional reaction and that, oh, this was terrible and I'm a terrible player and I let everyone down because you have this process in, in your routine. And so it's just your learning phase, right? You learn, you reflect, and it's not going to make it better or worse. I mean, you maybe had a poor performance and you had an impact in the loss. Not the sole reason, but yeah, there is. A, we're all responsible as teammates. Mm. But I think we can make it less, emotionally impactful when we reflect and then come up with a plan to make it better. You know, I know my college coach used to tell me the sun's going to come up tomorrow. And I like, I didn't sit with that. And I hated that for the longest time. Yeah. Like I was so devastated if I like didn't perform the way I wanted to. And I was so hard on myself, like every <laughs> high performing person. But then I realized like, yeah, the sun does come up tomorrow. And like, what can I take advantage of tomorrow to get back after it? Right. So yeah, if you, struggle with losses and failures like own it 
it's hard and then reflect on it and say, what can I do better tomorrow and get back after it? And just have amnesia, right? Have amnesia after that and move forward, <laughs> yeah. right? The goldfish, right? Like <laughs> 10 seconds, you That's never forget right. about it. And then you don't know what happened. So, man, here, I want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's very enlightening. Um, it was great, the conversations I have. And I really feel um, a lot of parents, a lot of athletes down here can definitely benefit from services uh, like this. Is there a website? How can we get a hold of you? You know, if there's anyone out there looking for, um, I guess, a session with you, do you take virtual patients yeah. or what does that look like? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I definitely have a website. Um, it's www.txopps.com. Um, you know, that's, that's a great place. I have some social media handles where I'd like to just educate, especially on Instagram, like what are some tips and education, some good frameworks. Um, and, and we do accept virtual clients and, and another framework too is like the resources that I could say, Hey, here's a great book or a video or other avenues as well. Um, or finding the best fit, right? The, the networks are always growing. And so, um, I'm happy to be a place that people can come to for a resource and I can find what their needs are and connect them in the right area for sure. Man, I love it, man. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be putting this out and we'll make sure to tag, um, all of your, your website and your handles there. But again, you know, from the RGV and from Biodynamic Athletics, I want to say thank you very much, Dr. Cawthon. We appreciate your time. Thank you for coming on and for sharing awesome knowledge with us. And uh, it's greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thanks so much.